Welcome back to the Bible is Art, where we are reading through page by page of Poetics of Biblical Narrative by Mary Sternberg. If you're interested in learning how to read the Bible as a literary work of high genius, this book is critical, and we are starting the first chapter, chapter one, literary text, literary approach, getting the questions straight. The few by nature formed, with learning fraught, born to instruct as others to be taught, must study well the sacred page and see which doctrine this or that does best agree with the whole tenor of the divine work. Uh, So this is by Dryden. And the idea of this quote is is to say that as you're working through the text, so in in this, in this, this quote sort of encapsulates in in many ways, like the whole idea, the, the whole picture of this book is that you, you are having, and he'll talk about this later in his work on, um, um, gaps, because essentially the whole process of interpretation is filling in of gaps and where you're putting together the purpose, the meaning, the ideology of, of the author. It's it, what the author is trying to communicate and believes. And so you're always working between that vision of what you think he's trying to communicate and the particularities, the words, the phrases of what you're reading, and you're having to put it together. Does this fit? So you get a phrase, and you're saying, okay, I think he's trying to say this. You're like, okay, you move on to the next one. So you now got two phrases. You're like, okay, so something's been added on, right? So is what I believe he's the meaning of, let's say, this episode the same now? Uh, or maybe I need to take away this little thing and put this thing in. Okay, here now I got three. Now um, that first and the last. How the, so you're you're constantly doing this thing about which doctrine this or that does best agree with the whole the tenor of the divine work, and so you're constantly building up this this uh, thing, and th- the meaning of the text out of these little parts, and each new word you're having to. S- slightly rearrange this thing, right? And and it's um and it is each word and each phrase. And this is the thing that um, many of these authors taught me, is that when you're and, and one of the beauties of the literary uh, literary interpretation, understanding that each word is is contributing something, is that you have to ask yourself. And and I and I always think about the um, interpretation as you can sum up like interpretation as always asking. Why this word in this way here? Why this phrase in this way and this way here? Or asking the question, why didn't the author say it this different way? Why was Abraham's name used and his pronoun not used, right? So all of, all of these questions and, and every new verse, because I, I think like probably many of us, grew up, and this is not a, a criticizing, but a, a just a sort of like, you grow to see things, right? You you have this idea that, um, and you have this, and you get this like in sermons where like often preachers will be like, okay, the sermon is about X, right? It's about having faith in God or, or, or praying during suffering or whatever it is. <clears throat> and what I, I'm not a fan of that practice. And I think because if, for a couple of different reasons, but one is that, um, you're sort of uh, what that does is that the the whole job of the text is a journey of discovery, where each wording is adding upon and driving you closer towards a thing that you don't see yet, right? And so it's it's almost like you're um, you're replacing that whole journey, right? And you're saying, okay, you have this thing now. Now you don't need these other things. Right. And so what, what many of these authors, Mayor Sternberg does is, is redirect your attention to each word and phrase and be always forcing you to say, OK, so what does that now tell you about the meaning of this text? What does this now tell you about the meaning of the text? And it's developing extreme attention and a skill of noticing of the text and never settling for a sort of like simplistic summary because it's always deeper than that. What goals does the biblical author narrate, the biblical narrator, what goals does the biblical narrator set himself? What is it that he wants to communicate in this or that story, cycle, or book? And this is a perfect example of exactly what I was talking right here, where you have a purpose in the biblical text of a sentence, and then 
sentences put together into a paragraph and then a story and then a cycle of three stories. And you can ask this question about, okay, now what is the goal of the story of these three cycles of, of these? And so you get these like increasingly higher arcings of meanings. What kind of text is the Bible and what role does it perform in context? What are all the variations on a fundamental question that students of the Bible would do well to pose loudly and sharply? The question of the narrative as a fundamental structure, a means to a communicative end, a transaction between the narrator and the audience on whom he wishes to produce a certain effect by way of certain strategies. That is like <laughs> what this book is talking about. The certain strategies are the poetics, right? Like all social discourse, biblical narrative is oriented to an addressee and regulated by a purpose or a set of purposes involving the addressee. So he's saying the Bible is just normal communication and normal communication, the story, so just like when you're communicating, right? The, the, the story here is oriented to addressee. So you have someone who is communicating, someone who's receiving the communication and they're doing that for a purpose, <laughs> like that's like communication 101. That's what all communication is and that's true of the Bible. Hence, our primary business as readers is to make purposive sense of it. That is, what is the purpose of this? What is the purpose of this communication? And what is the purpose of communication at each one of those narrative arcs? Sentence, uh, you know, you know, word, phrase, sentence, paragraph, episode, story, blah, blah, blah. Hence, our primary business as readers is to make purposive sense of it so as to explain the what's and the how's in terms of the why's of communication. Okay. This is exactly what we've been talking about, right? To make purposive sense of it. So our job is to explain what happens, how the poetics, and why the ideology, the purpose of it, right? So we want to get to the final purpose, but to get to the final purpose of this text and this phrase, we have to understand the how and the what of it, the mechanics, the poetics of it. Posing such a question in the clearest terms is a condition for reasonable and systematic inquiry rather than a panacea or a shortcut to unanimity. So what he's saying here is this question is a condition for reason, reasonable and systematic inquiry. So like it's it's a it's a it's a starting of a, a, a good discourse, a, a conversation, right? It's not to say that you're gonna get this uh, big perfect system when you come out of it that you can like plug in your numbers or whatever, right? The answers to it would doubtless still vary as well as agree, since the reticent narrator gives us no clue about his intentions except in and through his art of narrative. And so he's saying, yes, while it's not this like, it won't result in this uh, sort of like pristine structure or whatever, he's, he's saying that there will be agreement and variation. And the reason is because the narrator in the Bible is reticent. That is, he shows and he does not tell. The, that is, the, the biblical author doesn't talk about his poetics. So we are trying to construct this system, this poetics, this listing of techniques to communicate the message by means of reading it off his art. So we can't talk to the narrator and the narrator himself, himself is reticent. And he's reticent in, in more than one way. One is reticent because like he doesn't tell us, but he's reticent in another way in, the, in that the narrator is um, rarely injects his opinion into the story. So uh, he, he normally does not give his evaluation of characters. He shows his evaluation of characters. So he won't say that like, and this was right, and this was wrong, and Jacob was selfish, and stuff like this. No, he'll show it by means of cause and effect and literary art and all the poetics we're going to be talking about. And so the reticence of the narrator in many ways that he's just sitting back very quietly, it just makes it trickier to discover the poetics. But of course, that's part of the purpose, right? It's the wisdom of God to hide a matter, it's the wisdom of kings to search a matter out, right? Work is one of our fundamental duties, Genesis 1, and that includes intellectual work, physical work, all sorts of work. And so 
the fact that we have to do work to uncover this meaning is a normal structure of the life that God has created. To reconstruct the principles underlying the text givens, so to discover the poetics, his, his, uh, his, his set of techniques in his bag, his tools, therefore we must form hypotheses that will relate fact to effect. That is, it's like science, right? You, you form a hypothesis. I think the author does this with characters. So one thing Robert Alter talks about a lot is that the first thing characters say in text is normally like weighted as very important in terms of telling us something like about their character or their function in the plot. Um, so you want to pay attention to their first words. It's not like throwaway word, words, right? It's just like, it's like, I'm, you know, Bernice. I'm from here, and it's like it doesn't function in the story of other ways. That's not the way it is in biblical narrative. And so, um, if that's your theory, you you uh, you've got that hypothesis, and you relate the facts. So you work that through a bunch of texts and see the effect of that, whether it's true. And these may well differ in interpretive focus and explanatory power. That is to say, um, is that thesis about first words? Uh, more often true than not because, and this goes back to his like um, not a panacea or, or a shortcut to un unanimity because the author will vary this techniques and he talks about this in the preface is that um, the authors are not bound by these poetics, right? This wasn't a thing that <laughs> God gave them and they said, you have these 10 mechanisms and you're only allowed to use it in these ways. No, they'll get bend bent in certain ways for certain ideological ends, right? So, so for certain purposes. So just because it doesn't, isn't true in every case doesn't mean that it isn't a true poetics, right? So maybe the first word is uh, true of characters 80% of the time. Well, that's enough for us to, to say, yeah, that's true. That is like a standard piece of of poetic art. But even the differences, including those not or not immediately resolvable, would then become well-defined, intelligible, and fruitful. Okay, so this is a wonderful thing. So what he's saying is that this has a sort of like fractal structure to it. So let's take the, the examples just given, like first words, the importance of first words. Maybe you say like, okay, so this works, let's say, 60% of the time. And then 40% of the time, you're like, it doesn't sort of like exactly fit here. Then you're like, okay, so let's take each of these categories and see what's going on there. If there's further like categorical divisions that we can make. So for instance, among the ones where like first words are important, is there any more groupings that we can say? Uh, is it important to the character itself? Uh, is it important for plotting? How does this relate to other characters? So maybe like half the time, then the name is will be used ironically. So um, they're called like good, but they end up evil or something like that. That could be another category. And on the other side, maybe there's a whole another function of names. Maybe it could be something like when they're... Um, first words aren't important, it tells us something about the lack of importance of the character or something like that. So he's saying that the, 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 the differences, right, could, could even be, be, be fruitful because you could look, look into these things and be like, okay, so we know a marker is here, right? Maybe we're not sure what's like all on this side, but like, Let's look at that and figure that out, right? That they are not remarkable for being so in the present state of affairs is largely due to tendency to read biblical texts out of communicative context with little regard for what they set out to achieve and the exigencies attaching to its achievement. Elements thus get divorced from the various terms of reference that assign to uh, them to their roles and meanings, parts from wholes, means to ends, forms from functions. Nothing can be less, less productive or more misleading. Even the listing of so-called forms and devices and configurations, a fashionable practice, this among aspirants to literary criticism, is no substitute for the proper business of reading. So he's saying, you know, you can't just like list a bunch and be like hey, characters and find the characters. And then like that all sort of like deterministically like spit out some like meaning of the text or anything like that. And he's saying that, you know, it, it, like it's important to just be able to read the text skillfully. And and this is sort of like in contrast to a sort of like reading of like application where you, where you do like quick cursory reading and you, you think you've got the meaning and then you spit it out and then you sort of like apply the text or whatever. And he's saying like, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta sort of like, you gotta sit in the text for a while. You know what I'm saying? Like you gotta, you gotta ask like, 
what's actually going on? What was actually going on back then? You know, why did Moses say this? You know, like why didn't, because, and this is a question I like to ask where I'm like, you know, let's just take Genesis where it's like, you know, most of what happened during the time period, the Genesis was written is not recorded like 99.999% of it. What is recorded was selected very specifically for very specific ends and purposes. And so when, when you realize that it'd be like, because sometimes comes time we can get the, the idea, especially in like other texts, maybe like numbers or like chronicles, you'd be like, oh, I don't know. You just get like a bunch of like listing of like information or like historical facts or something. You'd be like, oh, no, no, most of it is not there. Most of it is not here. Right. So these are highly selected texts. And not just that, but the way that they're told is also uh, uh, highly specific. And so you you, you have to. Um, uh, put like put that in their communicative context. So like James Jordan will talk about how like you have this pattern of like three um, sins and then a fall, but then that gets interrupted. So you get you get in the garden, then Cain and Abel, and sons of God and daughters of men, and then you get a fall, and then you get uh, Noah's sons, and then Tower of Babel, and then you're expecting a third fall, and then like uh, 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 you know a decreation again, but then you get the calling of Abraham. So you get like you get a break in this pattern, right? And so you have these, um, and so if you're reading like any of those texts, you have to ask me like, what, what's a communicative context? And you just have to like sit in here to like understand what's going on because a lot of times like you won't actually get to the meaning of a text until you've just like sat in it for a long time, right? Since a sense of co coherence entails a sense of purpose, so for something to cohere, it has to have purpose, which is a, 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 a deep um, um, thought, true thought. It is not enough to trace a pattern. It must also be validated and justified in terms of communicative design. So just because you found some form or pattern, pattern here doesn't necessarily just mean like what we think about a pattern. It can mean like um, any, any of the poetics he's talking about. So like, pattern in terms of like that that uh, poetics is repeated. So like the first word things would be like a pattern, right? Um, he's saying, you can't just say, look at this pattern, right? You have to say, uh, you have to justify and validate in terms of communicative design. That is to say, you have to, you have to say, okay, so I see this pattern, but how does it contribute to the end, the purpose, the ideology of this story, right? Because often... Often, and this happens, oh my goodness, all the time. And this is why I always say like, and this is what I was talking about, like illusions. So like if you if you identify an illusion in a text, there's two steps always to being able to understand illusions. There's, the, there's first you have to identify to what is it alluding? And then the second step, which is often missed, is what is the purpose of the illusion? So you can't just say, hey, look at this illusion. You have to say, Okay, so so what work is that actually doing in this text? Because if it isn't, then it's as as Sternberg says, it's not validated and it's not justified. So just because you see a pattern doesn't mean because because at the end of the day, the purpose of the poetics is the ideology, and not the other way around. So the the, the at the end of the day, it's just that fundamental structure of like one person is trying to communicate something to the other through these techniques, through these means. These are their tools to bring the purpose over. So you can't just go through, be like listing all of these poda techniques and like very rarely touch on the big purpose because that is the whole idea of it. After all, the very question of whether that pattern exists in the text, whether it has any relevance and any claim to perceptibility turns on the question of what it does in the text. There we go. Unless firmly anchored in the relations between the narrator and the audience, therefore, formalism degenerates into a new form of uh, atomism. So formalism, where you're just trying to uh, pick out, uh, uh, identify the formal structures in the text. This is gapping. This is analogy. This is illusion, right? And it's like a new form of atomism, where it's just like, you're just picking stuff apart. You've laid out all the pieces. It's like it's like you you, you see like a cool like Lego structure, right? Like 
like the the Millennium Falcon, and you'd be like, okay, I really want to understand this, right? And 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 so maybe you're talking to a buddy, you're like, I really want to understand this. Be like, okay, so like, what do you what do you want to do? It'd be like, I'm, I'm gonna take it apart so I can understand it, and you'd be like, okay, yeah, yeah. So you take it apart and you lay all the parts out, and you're like, there, like. Or maybe, or maybe you take all the parts and like all the like same sizes you put together, and you're like, okay, there, look. And it's like, okay, you've atomized it. You've 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 put it into its all its its constituent parts. You've identified all the illusions. You showed me, uh, uh, um, like all the characters in the story, the major plot points. But do you understand the text any better now? Do you understand the Millennium Falcon any better now? No, not at all, right? And this, it, I mean, this is this is a sh- shockingly common in professional published comment- commentaries. I mean, uh, like w- where you will go through a text and you will you will learn no, more about the Hebrew or the Greek of this, right? More about like syntax structure, more about all these things than ever before. But you come away and you say, I have no idea what this text is about. That is that final purpose. I I mean, this is like in a top three problems in commentaries right here. And, And Mayor Sternberg like puts his finger on it, right? All of these things exist in this like hierarchical fractal (laughs) <laughs> relationship where they're all building up to that final big arc, which is like, what's the purpose of this thing at the end of the day? And all the parts are contributing to the whole. Like that's the fundamental structure of like a properly working organism and structure and church, right? It's that the parts are contributing to the whole, right? They have the role and they're contributing hearts. And it's shocking how often that's forgotten. Okay, so that's all we're gonna get to uh, this week. Let me know if you have any questions. And I'll see you in the next video.